Here's an idea. Kill La Kill is a warning about wearable technology. Like milk in the sun, this episode will spoil. So you have been warned, spoilers ahead. Kill La Kill is an anime series where the main character, Ryuka Matui, arrives at Hanoji Academy searching for her father's murderer. The academy is effectively presided over by the student council and their stoic leader, Lady Satsuki. Student council members and club leaders wear Goku uniforms, which are outfits made with life fibers, extraterrestrial beings that feed on the wearer, but in turn alter their DNA, imparting intense power and ability, things like weird strappy arms and flying band practice. Goku uniforms are ranked. The highest common rank is the three-star uniform, which is worn by the elite four of the student council, and they're made with 30% life fiber. All of this contributes to a very rigid class system at the academy. The students who wear normal fiberless clothes are the lowest class, while the one, two, and three-star Goku uniform wearers outrank their subordinates in both dress and physical and mental ability. Because remember, person plus life fiber equals ability. Ryuko and Lady Satsuki, on the other hand, wear kamui, suits which are made entirely from life fiber and are essentially sentient clothing. Now, if this is your introduction to Kill La Kill, at this point you probably have some questions. And usually, question number one is something along the lines of, okay, so I get that the clothing is sentient, but is it, technically speaking, clothing? Good point. Kill La Kill has lots of fan service and some downright troubling scenes at the start of the series. And this is a really big topic of conversation. Is this warrantless over-sexualization? Is it a depiction of the weaponization of femininity? Is it empowering or just disgusting? These are incredibly important and super interesting questions that we are just gonna skip right over. Links to people who have done them great justice in the doobly-doo, though, to discuss the other off-confronted inspiration for KLK's style. Fascism. The power structure, Goku uniforms, and all of the pageantry surrounding the student council all look like they were pulled from the Fascism for Beginners handbook. And just so we're on the same page here, fascism is a political doctrine where the state is given priority above all. Fascists promise national glory while violently oppressing those who dare question their authority. Fascist states are often governed by charismatic leaders, prioritize war and military action, and encourage ultra-nationalism. That ultra-nationalism is often expressed as a kind of indulgence, lots of celebration and ceremony, symbolism and iconography, things signifying prestige and honor, even though generally fascists are warmongering monsters and are widely regarded as the worst people in history for very, very good reasons. Theorist Walter Benjamin even referred to fascism as the aestheticization of politics in his essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. He wrote that fascism sees its salvation in giving these masses not their right, but instead a chance to express themselves. The logical result of fascism, then, is the introduction of aesthetics into political life. Furthermore, all efforts to render politics aesthetic culminate in one thing, Benjamin says, war. Which is essentially the starting premise of Kill La Kill. Masses of students stuck inside a rigid system with plenty of ability to express themselves, mostly through club choice, it would seem, but who are ultimately conscripted by the student government into the literally violent maintenance of the status quo. Ryuko then shows up to cut the whole thing down. Literally. And metaphorically. And literally again, because she has a giant half a scissors. The show's premise is likely at least partially inspired by the fact that cut, kill, and wear all sound similar in Japanese, as do fashion and fascism. So this is like some Raymond Roussel level how I wrote a certain of my anime series. It even opens with a classroom lesson on fascism. Literally. Just literally this time. But all this talk about KLK and fascism and fashion leaves out one thing, which Benjamin also touches upon in the work of art. He writes that the destructiveness of war furnishes proof that society has not been mature enough to incorporate technology as its organ. That technology has not been sufficiently developed to cope with the elemental forces of society. 
The clothing, the life fibers, Goku uniforms, Kamui, and all of the power granting garb in Kill La Kill is not simply aesthetic or ornament or signifier. It's also technology, wearable technology. I know, I know, Goku uniforms are not a computer or sensor or whatever, but that's also a very narrow concept of technology, which isn't just stuff that blinks. It's the total set of applied knowledge that we use to accomplish things. Life fibers might be a living organism, but they are used as a technology, the result of applied knowledge that allow its users to behave more effectively in the world. And so, assuming you're still on this long walk with me, there is a question that I think KLK poses, which is, is there a risk that wearable technology could contribute to some dystopian class nightmare like what happened at Hanoji Academy? Or, to put it in Benjamin's terms, is society mature enough to incorporate technology as its organ, perhaps now a little bit more literally than Benjamin intended, without it turning into some kind of disaster. Well, let's just come out and say that Google Glass is probably not going to cause some kind of uber-dystopian techno-fascist cyber future. Probably. But lots of wearable technology is conspicuous. It works as its own advertisement because it is on your body, which other people interact with. So it's easy to see that conspicuousness as a kind of willful demonstration of status. And technology like glass does allow people to act more effectively in the world, to know, see, do, and access more than the unequipped. Which is awesome and easy to celebrate, and maybe we should, but perhaps Kill La Kill's lesson is that the crazily increased agency we experience when the space between ourselves and our technology collapses to almost nothing is an effect of some much larger system or set of intentions and agents that doesn't or don't necessarily hold the interests of its subjects in the highest regard. Which, you know, is an arrangement that we are not strangers to by any means, but maybe takes on a new level of importance now that bodies, literally and directly, are involved. And for the record, I'm not saying that Kill La Kill is advocating any kind of technological abstinence. At the end of the series, the bad guys are defeated only because of a symbiosis between body augmenting clothing and its wearer. A balance, as they put it, between wearing and being worn. Of course, this raises all kinds of questions about who has the agency in the relationship between humanity and technology, but as a common theme on Idea Channel, I'm sure that you are prepared to sort of mull that one over yourself for a little while. I guess all I'm saying is that we should be careful because I don't want one of us to have to go to space to disable the thing so that the social fabric uniting us is no longer hijacked by some parasitic force working in concert with a global mega corporation. That's all I'm saying. And if that doesn't make any sense, I wouldn't be surprised not making sense is kind of our thing. What do you guys think? Is Kill La Kill some kind of warning against wearable technology? Let us know in the comments. And if you want to join the Idea Channel Club, please subscribe. I don't know what our Goku uniforms would look like. Maybe something like a like a Borgesian kind of library, sort of like if Project Gutenberg were infinite and clothes. A noble spirit embiggens even the shortest Idea Channel comment. Let's see what media you guys love. Okay, so first things first, last week's episode was clearly a little bit different from what we normally do, so to everybody who had very nice things to say about it, thank you. It really, it means a lot. When we do something different, it sometimes feels a little risky and it's nice to be encouraged, so. Thanks. And two more short things of business before we get on to actual comments. We were nominated for a streamy, so that is super exciting, and we are in a great company with Our Second Life and Jerry Seinfeld and Shay Carl, and it's just, ah, whew, that's cool. And we're gonna start taking comments from the subreddit. So if you want to leave comments in the subreddit, you can do that and I will read them. I'll maybe read or respond to maybe two a week? We'll see. We'll see how this works. We're gonna try this out. Link in the doobly-doo. Sketchbook Short Films writes a really awesome love letter to Pokemon, which is just, it's very good. And really makes me think, you know, Pokemon is such a great candidate for this kind of media because, there, right, there is this idea of kind of, of battling against the world and of collecting and there are these Pokemon that stay with you throughout your entire experience of the game and this, yeah, this was, this was awesome. Thank you for writing this and for sharing it. Desada writes about Quantum Leap being the piece of media that shaped their view of the world in a significant way, and I can totally see this. I watched a lot of Quantum Leap, and it's, I think it's really easy, especially when you're young, 
to see Quantum Leap as something of a, like, providing a moral compass, right? Like, Sam's whole thing is righting these little wrongs, and so it has this very moral backbone to it, and it provides you ways to navigate these situations when you see them in your life, which, yeah, you know, being young and impressionable, watching Quantum Leap, yeah, I feel it. As our Pilhar writes, a really great comment about how the Pixies played an important role, and not just the band, but a specific cassette, like a specific object containing their music. And I think this is really interesting, and maybe, like, I don't know if this is uncommon, because I think about when I first started listening to, like, the Dismemberment Plan, um, I place a lot of value on their record Emergency and I, but not the specific disc, even though it is a thing that is older than most other objects I own and actually was itself re like really influential, but it's it's the music that I place the importance on and not the thing, which is, that's this is something I'm gonna have to think about. This is a really great comment and a really great distinction between object and media. Thank you for writing us. Miss Roxy Girl 333 talks about how her love of K-pop has led her not only to kind of adjust and become involved in the K-pop like fandom, but also Korean culture as a maybe secondary effect of a love of this media, which I, right I can only see as a really awesome thing. This sort of a growing understanding of other cultures through their media that you love. So that's yeah, right. To James Dickinson. Thank you very much. And it was no mistake that Jack Gilbert, who is one of my favorite poets, was used in this episode about one of my favorite TV shows. For anybody who wants poetry to read, please, Jack Gilbert's The Great Fires is one of the greatest things ever written by man. It's so good. Lunar Blade Studios talks about how Dragon Ball Z has had a positive effect on his life. And you know, I was actually just thinking yesterday about how Goku might be one of the most fundamentally good characters in all of media. Like, he is just a good person. So, yeah, I totally see it. And to Lunar Blade Studios, I'm glad you found DBZ. To Censor Glitch, me not put this comment on the show? That's impossible. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these co-presidents of the Video Editing Club. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit, which, remember, you can now leave comments on and they may or may not end up in the show. I will be responding to maybe, like, two from the subreddit every week. And the tweet of the week comes from Melvillian, who has made a Spotify playlist of as many of the records he could find that were featured on our wall. So that's exciting. Plenty of listening. So there's no record swap this week. Uh, everybody made really awesome suggestions last week, some of which I took, so there are records on the way to replace the last two that need to be replaced. Uh, so as repayment for there not being a record swap, here is me getting a bunch of ice dumped on my head. Guess what next week's video is about? What could it be? It's actually kind of pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty cool, is a sentence that I feel like I am required to say. Um, so I donated to the ALS Foundation. I'm also going to up my Patreon contributions over the next couple months. And I'm not going to challenge anyone specific, just anybody watching this, that if you have been thinking about supporting something and you are waiting for a reason or an excuse to do it, use this as your excuse. Give $100 or whatever you can afford to a thing that makes you happy and proud to support.